Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. My name is Jackson Mummy, and each week we'll be bringing you updated information about the bar exam and what you need to do in order to make the next bar exam your last bar exam. Ready to get started? Let's jump to it. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Today is Wednesday, June 14th. We are inexorably, slowly moving towards July 2023 bar exam and outer space there. I'm thinking about that because I'm looking at Tracy's background. You're in outer space today, aren't you? That's right. I'm coming from way beyond the stars. Wait, there you go. <laughs> in addition to Tracy being here, we've got Brianna, we've got June, we've got Amanda. We're glad to have all of you who are with us live today. And if you're watching or listening later, we're glad to have you as well. We come to you every week to talk about all things bar exam related. We've got some updates on what we're doing in the course. We have some student questions and we're gonna drop those off to our panel and talk about those questions. I think just thinking about this at about the 40, 42 day period, this is what I historically call the week from hell, the dreaded seventh week. And uh, Amanda, I know you, you, you can, react or respond to that. You remember the dreaded seventh week? I do. Yes. It feels so close. And I feel like I remember thinking I will not possibly make enough improvements from here until the bar to, to pass this exam. Felt like I knew nothing still. <laughs> yeah. It's a pretty horrible feeling, isn't it? And you, you feel like the exam is just going to happen tomorrow, but it's not. And so the disconnect between what you're able to do and where the bar feels is just too big right now. Brianna, you went through the dreaded seventh week too, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. But it's funny because you're always hitting the nail right on the head with all of those emails that you send out. It's amazing because I feel like you're always like, I felt like you were always talking straight to me. So definitely pay attention to those. But yeah, it's that, that feeling that you're just not going to get through everything and, you know, it's it's it feels like it's so close yet still so far away yeah yeah and i just want to remind everybody it is still a long way away and there's a lot of growth that happens one of the things i suggest to people is if you feel like the exam is imminent go back in time 45 days right or 40 days and in this situation if we go back that far that takes us back to the end of april and that seems like forever right? Forever. And you think, wow, how much have I accomplished since the end of April? You still got that much time ahead of you. It's funny how our brains tend to look forward and think that's immediate, but we think backwards and we think that's forever. So there's that disconnect. But this is a week when historically we see people picking fights, road rage, baristas, mentors, spouses, family members. It's important to, to control your internal emotions right now, because this is when you're going to feel probably at your lowest. And as you start improving over the next few weeks, you start to feel more in control. But right now, that distance between what you know and what you think you should know is probably the greatest. And that's always a scary feeling. Junior, you've watched this now, I don't know how many times. It, it is like setting your clock, isn't it? Yeah. It is. It is. And the thing about it is, is it'll all be okay. <laughs> Take a deep breath. And it's, we've still got quite a ways to go. And like you said, it'll just it's almost like overnight you wake up and go, Oh, I'm okay. I know this stuff. I'm going to be all right. And then we see a calm down there. The calmness comes over everyone. But the seventh week, this week, it does get tense. But like Jackson said, just take a breath. You can only do what you can do. You can only control what you control. And that is you and your reactions. So just take a deep breath, listen to a paralimital and tell yourself, I'm fine. This will go away. This will all be all right. There you go. In the same vein, we have added to our listing of workshops. And we now are offering two very specific workshops for writing. One of them is the personal writing workshop that Brianna is doing. And the other is our new performance test workshop that Amanda is doing. 
I'm excited about both of those. And we've had students jumping into both. I've wildly underpriced the package if you order both right now. That pricing will not stay in effect for very long. If you're going to order both, go ahead and do it now because price is going up. But these workshops are two call sessions. You're working specifically on how to write an essay or how to write a performance test, and then actually practicing and getting some feedback. Brianna, you've been teaching the personal writing workshop for a while now. It's a valuable tool to a student, I think, to give them a foundation before they jump into the, the coaching or even more writing on their own. Absolutely. It is the fundamentals of writing FLA. I'm not going to be destroying your essay that you turn into me with regards to content or whether you got it right or wrong. It is the fundamentals of writing FLA. Facts, law, argument, or analysis, whatever you want to call it. And really trying to dissect your tone and how you're writing it and the way you write it, your audience. And it is it is just, I think it's a valuable tool for every single one of our students, just like right when they get going. Or if you're even questioning, am I writing an FLA? Schedule a call. Don't let that worry and fear and just what if linger for the next couple of weeks leading up to the exam. Just schedule it, purchase the product, and just get that knowledge of whether or not you're really in there or not. Yeah, and it's definitely not too late to do this. In fact, this is probably the best time to be doing it if you haven't done it already. Amanda, we just started the performance test workshop a couple of weeks ago, but you've already had a lot of people going through it. What's that experience been like for them? I think it's been really great. I think that the one-on-one -on -one focus on just the MPT is something that I know my motivation to coach at Jackson was because a lot of students shy away from wanting to do it. It's grueling. It's 90 minutes. And a lot of people tend to ignore it, put it on the back end. I was the same way. So that's why I wanted to do it. I never wanted to practice MPTs, but during my coaching sessions, Jackson encouraged me to submit MPTs. Boy, was it helpful because I was writing and I thought I was doing great. And Jackson showed me like, nope, this is not the style you use for this kind of multi-state performance test or performance test. And I think a lot of students are having those aha moments right now just from getting that one-on-one -on -one. and they can ask questions they can say I don't understand this can you clarify it can you put it a different way and so I really think it's invaluable that the aha moments are so rewarding too <laughs> to see the progress like from the first time to the second time it's been it's been great yeah I'm really excited that Brianna and Amanda are doing these because they are both very talented teachers they're both very talented writers they've been through the exam they know how to work on that and to offer that to you so June I imagine is probably going to put the link up in the chat box but I would really strongly encourage you if you have not been through those workshops to check them out they're very reasonably priced they're easy to do and they will make a difference in your work, no doubt. And we'll have a question later that came up during one of the MPT workshops that I want to get to, but we'll save that for a little bit later. I also want to just let you know that this is the time when a lot of students for the July exam start realizing that they want or need some personal coaching in their writing more than what we do in the writing workshop or the MPT workshop. And we have made it possible now for you to select from any of our panel to work with you on your writing. You can work with Tracy, Brianna, Amanda, or me. And the coaching upgrades are available in your online course. They are reasonably priced, I think, and you can pay for them over 12 months or get a discounted single course price. But what I do want to remind you is that as we get closer to the exam, it gets tougher to get your calls in. It's not so much that we can't accommodate you, it's that you aren't going to be able to write fast enough to get all that work done. So at this point, at about 45 days or so to the exam, 
is really optimum in my mind for adding that coaching if you want it. It can be the most helpful to you right now. We get into a two-week window. It's pretty tough to get full value out of the coaching. We're glad to do what we can. But I think this is the time to be looking at that. So make sure you get into your online course. Look at the a unit that says upgrade to personal coaching, you will see the links to order. And then you can choose the mentor that you want. And it might be based on what you've seen in these calls on Wednesdays or in the group calls, or maybe just because of logistics. Just so you know, Tracy and I are in the mountain time zone. So we cover the Pacific zone pretty easily. Brianna's in the central time zone and Amanda's in the Eastern time zone. So if that makes a difference, that's what we're offering. The advantage of getting this coaching, I cannot overstate to you. It makes a difference. And you've just heard both Brianna and Amanda reference back to when they were working with me. They thought they were doing some things well. And Brianna, you were talking about going back and looking at an old conference that you and I did. Um, that's a bit of a shocker, isn't it? It truly is. The amount of insecurity that I was displaying on my one-on-one -on -one coaching call with Jackson was just astounding. So it's a reminder to me that, and to remind you guys or let you guys know that we have truly been where you are. We make the best coaches because we wrote like you. We thought like you. We, we've had all of our stuff ripped apart the exact same way. Um, we can relate in a different way when you come to the table and bring your essay to the table. But yeah, it was definitely a blast from the past. I love to see how far I've come since then. You've come a long way. There's no doubt about that. And really positive. So I encourage you to check out the upgrades as well. Final thing I wanted to just mention, but I'm very excited about is we have boot camp coming up in November 3rd and 4th in Denver. And this is our boot camp for people taking the exam in 2024. So if you're a February or a July 2024 student, boot camp is the place to be. It's a two-day event. And I'm very pleased we've got people already registering for this boot camp. We are only going to accept 15 students into boot camp. We did it that way in May. It was very successful. And so we've decided to do the same thing. There is an application fee to apply for boot camp and a short questionnaire to fill out. If you're accepted into boot camp, your $100 application fee will be applied to your tuition. And if you're not accepted, then we will refund that back to you. We really want you to come to boot camp. It's a great opportunity to learn photo reading. Whether you're already a photo reader and you need a refresher or you've never learned it, we will teach it to you during boot camp. Tracy will be there to teach writing and to offer her insights as a sitting judge for how many years? 30 years? Am 33. 33. 30. Wow, that's amazing. So there's 33 years mm -hmm. worth of experience as a judge in the room. And then June will be there to coach mindset. And then we'll be showing you how to use photo reading for essay writing, for multiple choice test taking, and for performance tests. It is a terrific experience. The students that were there in May had a great experience. We got some wonderful comments from them and we'll be sharing those in the weeks and months to come. The other thing I would tell you about bootcamp is that you can pay for it on a monthly basis. So the wise people that are registering now will be able, if they choose, to pay monthly and have this almost paid off by the time they arrive in November. Again, we're only taking 15 students applications are available now. Make sure you that you check that out. And if you're taking the exam in 2024, really, you should be at boot camp. It, it makes a difference. And we see the results exam after exam of people that are at boot camp. So be sure to check that out. All right. We got some interesting questions this week <clears throat> from students as they were studying. And it's always interesting to me to see how the flow of the questions go. I send them out to our coaches, and I think sometimes we look at them and go, well, really? That's a question. <laughs> but I wanted to start with a fairly broad question that, that we got from a student who said, I've noted that the uniform bar exam, the UBE, is easier to pass than Georgia or Florida or California. Why is that? And I thought that was really a good question, because obviously there are a fair number of people, quite a few people, 
that take those three exams, California, Florida, and Georgia in particular, and are not successful. And one of the strategies that we uh, suggest is if you're eligible to sit for the UBE, and not everybody is, but if you're eligible, it makes sense if you've taken a couple of shots at these other exams without success to switch over to the UBE. Now, I have some thoughts about why I think it's easier, but I, I'm going to also jump in and, and let Brianna and Amanda talk about it since they took and passed the UBE. But one of the things that I like about it is that it's not idiosyncratic. It's not state-specific. It is graded and scored in each individual state, but the grading and the scoring is set up by the National Conference of Bar Examiners. So what they provide is what's called a draft or point sheet. That is the grading sheet that is to be used. So if you sit for the exam in Colorado or you sit for it in New York, you should theoretically be graded the same way. And I like that. It gets you out of the idiosyncratic view of the examiners in a particular state. So I think that's one of the big reasons to take this exam. You don't have to learn state law. You're learning generalized law, and there's a big crossover between the multi-state subjects and the UBE subjects. So those are a couple of things that I see. Brianna, is there anything that jumps out at you about why the UBE is a, a better test to take? Yeah, and my only real comparison, I can't remember how long the, the other state-specific bar exams are, but when Texas was its own state bar, it was a longer exam. It was more material to have to go through. Um, and like you said, you know, that the point sheet gives the examiners less room to be subjective about their grading. When I made the decision to switch to the UBE, even when I took UBE, Texas was still state specific. So I followed Jackson's recommendation to go with UBE instead of Texas State, that amongst other reasons. But it was because it was going to be more broad material, less think, less topics to review, less state specific, a shorter exam. I even went to New Mexico, which is going to be a much smaller room and crowd to take the exam in. So if you're taking UBE, it's also something to consider. You don't necessarily have to sit in a huge state. You can go take it in a smaller state as well to, if that's something that maybe messes with I your think, anxiety. Yeah, and I think sometimes it does. Amanda, you took the New York bar exam when it was New York, and then you took the UBE. So you've had an experience in both of those. What's your take on the UBE? Yeah, I have had experience in both of those. I think the UBE essays are much easier to prepare for, very predictable. I like the style of just like doing the same thing over and over again, the way like FLA fits with that. So that's one thing I could say for certain. Um, I also think same with the MPT. I think it's more predictable, right? We have like a formula of how to do it. And while I can't speak to California, Florida, or Georgia, I, I do remember in just preparing for New York, not having that same formulaic approach or not feeling like I could have the same one. Of course, that was a while ago, but I like the UBE based on knowing exactly what, you're not going to know the question, you're not going to know the content, but it's fairly predictable in that you're going to know exactly what's ahead of you and exactly how to answer the question, even if you don't know what the question is yet. Yeah, I think those are all good points. And of course, the scoring on the UBE, you can get licensed with a minimum score of 260 out of a 400 point scale. And if we put that in comparison to California, you'd need a 278. In Florida, you would need a 260, 31, 262. Georgia, you'd need a, a, a 170, 240. No, that's not right. Oh, my math is really bad. A three, I don't know, some crazy number. I'll have to figure it out. But you'd need a higher number in Georgia still. <laughs> math, I should, yeah, I know Tracy's laughing. It's like, yeah, he never understood math. Um, in any event, the scoring is more wide open. It gets you licensed. And then you can have the experience that Amanda and Brianna had, which is that you score so highly that you get licensed potentially in, I don't know, 40 some states, which is, pretty amazing when you think about it it's that just didn't exist Tracy when you took the bar it was one and done right you, you take it you get into one state yeah that's it that's it yeah. that's how it was so, when I first took it so it's pretty yeah. awesome and it, it was really two, and, is. two and a half full days 
Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So let me go back. George is a 270. <laughs> and you would get the number finally. So the reality is that I think the UB is a good choice. And if you are struggling with any state, I've mentioned California, Florida, Georgia, but if you're struggling with any of the states that are not UBE, I think it makes sense to look at switching over and thinking about that, certainly for 2024. So, <clears throat> good question and a strategy that I think is worth checking out. Another question that came up a lot in the last week, because this is the time, typically when people have been sitting in a big box bar review <clears throat> they've been there for a couple of weeks and they begin to realize it's not working for them. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't work for anybody, but for a fair number of people, they get into the, the those courses, they sit there for a while and they go, wow, this is just not working. It's not resonating. I feel lost and feels like a waste of my time. And they switch over and they enroll for our course. And of course, the number one question you get at this point is, I've just enrolled in your course. Do I have enough time to get ready for the July exam? The answer is unequivocally yes. Every exam, we have people that come to us at about this period of point, point in time, and they study and they pass the exam. And you might be saying, how could that possibly be? <clears throat> because the big boxes are telling me I need five or 600 hours to prepare. Our course is generally about 250 hours to prepare. And the difference comes in repetition versus memorization. It takes a long time to memorize, takes a lot of work, takes a lot of grunt work and busy work, and it pays very little in the way of actual points and dividends, but you end up spending about double the amount of time to get at the same amount of material. So in our course, you have the ability to streamline because you're not trying to memorize. I think one of the big mistakes that students make, and I'd be curious what the panel thinks, but one of the big mistakes that, that our students can fall into a trap is that they take our course and then they try to fit it into what they remember from the big box and they try to use our course to memorize or to put material into their conscious brains instead of letting it flow through the non-conscious. And then they get frustrated and stuck. Does that resonate at all with any of you? You seen that with any of, the, of your students? Or am I just making that up? No, I've definitely seen that. I've also seen like even some like resistance on coaching calls of people saying, Amanda, I think when it comes down to it, like you need to know the law, you need to have the law memorized. And I think there's a difference between memorization and having things in your conscious and unconscious brain. But again, I would disagree. And I'm, we're not at the point where I start talking about how you could actually get through this exam, I think, with knowing very little law. But I'll probably get on that train later as we get closer. We'll save that nugget, right? But I still would disagree. I don't really think you need to know as much law as you think you need to get through this exam. So it's interesting. Of course, I can't make anybody buy in, but I certainly see that, right? And if and people reaching for, if you could just give me the one tool that will let me memorize this faster, right? If you could just give me the one thing that can just get it, get it right here. When I think in like the front of their brain, memorize it and like churn it out, right? But there's just so much more to the exam than that. Yeah, the practice of law is not about memorization. And so it's just not a skill that's rewarded on the test, even though people put an inordinate amount of time into it. Brianna, do you get this feedback from students as well sometimes that they're trying to take it and fit it into this other format? Yeah, I, and it's not just that. One of the things that I also see students do is trying to not just do celebration, but they also want to do and incorporate other programs into it. And it, it's just not feasible. What celebration, what the, the, God, the amazing thing about Celebration Bar Review is how it's set up in the outline and the repetition and the stacking and the non-memorizing and trying to incorporate that into some of these other programs and trying to mesh them, it just doesn't work. It doesn't fit, and you know, it's it's so I try to encourage my students just to let the other stuff go. You've invested in this program, trust the process, um, and it's, it's it's all we can do. It's tough though. I get the fight back with Iraq and FLA and why is FLA better, and it just is. 
It okay. just is. Tracy, we heard trust the process a lot at boot camp, didn't we? We did. And the thing is that our brains do not learn through transactional memorization. They learn through relational work. So think about if you go into a restaurant and you see somebody and you know them, but you can't quite get their name right away. What do you do? Maybe you go up and say, who the hell are you? Tell me who you are. But for me, I try to think, is that somebody's is that somebody's brother? Was that somebody I went to high school with? Is that somebody that I sent to jail? What is the relation here? And then that's when it pops in for me. And studying for the bar is the same way. If you use flashcards, if you try to memorize things in isolation, very transactional method, then when you get to the exam, you're not going to have anything to be able to pull it together. It's learning to use the relation between the concepts, between the fact patterns that you see, between the writing that you've done. With FLA is a very relational style. How, do the, how does the facts relate to what you're looking at for the question? How does the law relate to the facts and to the arguments? And how does your conclusion relate to all of them. If you try to write them separately, that's when they get all disjointed. So it's changing the way that you think about things from that transactional one, then the other, then the other, to how does this all fit together in a body of work? And that's what law practice is all about. You have I, I to think you're right. how to be relational. Yeah, I think that's really a good point. And, and I think in all of this, if I'm going to bring it back to the practical side of how do you get through the material in the time we have remaining, a couple of things. One is there are time frames for every assignment built into the course. You'll see them listed for every assignment. Follow those. <laughs> I'm always surprised when people say, I don't think I've got enough time to get through the course. Really? Yes. How long are you taking on that assignment? I'm taking double the amount of time that you put into the uh, the assignment. Hello, you don't need that. And then the student typically says to me, but you don't understand, I'm special. We do understand, you are special, but you don't need that time because we're not trying to put it into your conscious brain up here. We're trying to put it in the non-conscious and so faster actually is better for our purposes. I think that's number one. And number two is you will see assignments that say optional. If they're not interesting to you and you don't feel like you need them, skip them. You don't have to do every single assignment that's in the course. There may also be subjects that you feel more comfortable in, and you can speed up the lecture to 1.2 or 1.5 or 2.0 and go faster that way. As we get into the month of July, we're going to talk about some products like bar maps and multi-state video nutshells and some other things that we offer that are really good hacks at getting through material faster. But I would caution you that you don't want to rely on those too early. In other words, they've got a value, a real value. And I think bar maps has an amazing value right now. But there are parts of bar maps that are what we call a fast finish. You don't need the fast finish today. You need the fast finish when we get into July. So be patient, work through the course. If you're getting stuck, one of the things I would suggest is that Brianna offers a time management workshop. It's a 30 minute workshop. And it's a fabulous way to get her expertise. And I know, Brianna, you actually set up a spreadsheet with students. You show them how to get from where they are to the exam, correct? Absolutely. And they get their weekly guideposts. They know exactly how many hours they need to be putting in every single week in order to be able to get through the material. It reduces anxiety. It reduces that overwhelm. It takes it and takes this huge mountain of material and puts it down into little bite-sized pieces. And, and I think having those guide guideposts, those weekly guideposts are essential in order to be able to get through the material. Yeah, I think it's really a, a valuable resource. And we've had lots and lots of students go through that workshop. And I think if you're just coming into the course and you're at all struggling with the timing, this would be money and time well spent to get that assistance. So thanks. I, I appreciate that feedback from all of you. I think there's a lot of wisdom there about how to get from where we are to the exam. I'll just cap it by saying you have a lot of time. It doesn't feel like it to you. We get that, but you have a lot of time. 
And so just don't panic. <laughs> That's really the key, right? <laughs> don't panic. It's way too early for panic. In fact, it's always too early for panic. But right now, you don't need to be in that mode. So if you've just started the course, welcome. We're glad to have you here. You'll have enough time to get everything done. Along the same lines, we got several questions that essentially said, I've got a lot of your resources, and then they would list the specific workshop or tools or add-ons that they had. And the students would say, but I'm not sure, I need some guidance to prepare for the exam using those tools. How can I get that? I want to start by saying that the best place to get guidance for those things is to jump on a group coaching call. I cannot imagine a better place than a group call to say, I'm not sure how to use bar maps, or I'm not sure what the best way is to use the video nutshells, or whatever the product or service might be. But you guys are the group coaches. Am I putting you out there? Are you like, oh no, don't make us, don't make us deal with that, Amanda? No, that's yeah, exactly right. And I also think some people come to group coaching want to wanting to review content which is not the, that's not the place for it. The place for group coaching is to review strategy, how to use the tools, learn from your peers, get support, right? Bring us things that you're struggling with non-content related because honestly, so much of preparing for this exam is not about the legal content. So this is a great time to talk about, yeah, how, to, like in my group coaching call, we talked about mind mapping, how to make our mind mapping more interactive, I showed some examples of what my mind maps look like and examples how they could look differently to give students ideas and a starting spot. So we had a lot of questions about how to mind map, right? Where does my map come into the studying? Where is it most useful? And we talked through that together as a group and students really learned from each other. So things like that, questions like that, perfect, perfect thing for group coaching. Let me piggyback on that because I know out of that call, we had some students then that said, hey, couldn't I just have Amanda's mind maps? And our answer to that is no, okay. because there's it's important to do your own mind maps to learn from the process, right? And if you're using bar maps, we give you the foundation, the framework, but we still want you to do your own. You want to talk about that a little bit, Amanda, since that came up in your call? Yeah, and yeah, there were several students who asked about that. And it's, I know it's, again, I think it's so tempting just to say, oh my gosh, look, like, it's already there, but that's not it. Like those mind maps, I really just would think they're useless. They're not going to serve. My mind maps are useless to Brianna, right? They're useless to Jackson. I wouldn't understand how that would help you in any way because it really is the process, right? And I don't think students are intentionally looking for shortcuts. It just seems like, oh, it's done. But it's not about it being done. It's about the process to get there. It's not like, oh, my mind map's done. Like, my mind map's never done. I could add to my mind map forever, right, about these subjects. But it was my process I used to get there that I learned enough information to get a passing score on the bar. And that's what we want you to do. It would literally be us. Like, I'm sure I could make some beautiful mind maps and we could sell them for a lot of money, right? We could probably do that, but it would be useless to our students. It really would be. But I could make some beautiful mind maps. For you, I have you know? no doubt. You have some <laughs> stunning mind maps. But it Brianna, wouldn't help. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Brianna, what's your take on that? Yeah. Think about it, it's if you are trying to use somebody else's mind map, you're shoving yourself back into this memorization category of trying to learn the law. So we talked a little bit about it it's on my call yesterday as well and the mind mapping. And I had a student who was trying to mind map every essay question, and then they were doing separate mind maps for every MBE question. And I'm sitting here going in my head like, okay, I'm not even sure how that would like physically make sense to me. If it makes sense to you, great. But what I'd also want you to see is I want you to incorporate that individual question, that individual essay, individual MBE into the bigger picture. So like in contracts, if we're dealing with consideration, where does that fit into bigger mind map of contracts? And what makes sense to me may not make sense to you. So when I connect those dots, like Amanda said, my mind map is going to be completely useless to another individual who doesn't make those same exact connections that I did. So I just creating your own mind map is it's crucial for it to be beneficial. Yeah, and I think it goes back to Tracy's point about relational understanding. 
the mind map is fundamentally relational, not transactional. And so the process as both Brianna and Amanda are describing is a relational process. That's what brings it back to your brain when you're in the exam. And that's why we want you to do it. Now you might say, why do you provide mind maps in the bar maps product? Well, we create the framework for you, but it is literally, it's not a fully articulated mind map for any subject. It is, here's the wireframe and you can go in then and we avoid the mechanical rote pieces of taking the table of contents and putting it in and just giving you a jump start to get that done. So I think it's a useful tool. I know it's a useful tool, but you don't want to rely on somebody else's mind maps. And we have lots of students that post their mind maps in the community group. You can see examples in the mind map webinar that we offer. We go through tons of examples of that. If you come to boot camp, we will show you how to mind map. So it there are lots of ways to get that. But we think mind mapping is a big deal and something you should be doing. So definitely wanted to explore that just a little bit and talk about that. As long as we're talking about bar maps and mind maps, one of the questions we got, a student said, I want to know if there's an expiration to the bar maps once I purchase them. That is, I want to know if I'd have continuous access to them after I'm done with my exams in July. And the answer to that is yes, they're available to you forever. They're in your permanent library. But I wanted to get to another sort of subtle part of that question. Students said, I'm asking because I want to continue my bar prep after my July exams. This is a student taking the July test. Panel, what's your reaction when you get that question? I, I'm going I'm to put you guys on the spot here for a minute. Brianna, what do you, you've got an interesting look on your face when you hear that. I get curious because it sounds like you're preparing to fail. And it's one of the things that the mindset there is going to make you fail. I try to tell my students, you know, approach the exam as though failure is not an option. Approach it as if you're telling yourself, I am an attorney. The minute I get, the minute I am done taking that exam, I am a licensed attorney. And so that, that's my, my, my yeah. gut instinct. I would really like to see that kind of shift in, yeah. in the mindset there. Yeah. I'm, the answer I'm is you'll have access to everything, but go ahead, Amanda, go ahead. No, I'm seeing that too. Like I, like I'm seeing that reluctance to shift the mindset like at this point and I think I'd even said in one of my coaching now's the time we decide are we going to take the bar or not are we going to pass the bar or not and I think some of my students in my coaching call got it but they were like what do you mean like we are taking it I was like no now we make you made the decision to take it but we make all the little decisions now about whether we're going to pass it it's not just a decision to take it. Now we make all those decisions. Are we going to commit to the mindset? Are we going to commit to the schedule that we worked on with Brianna? Are we going to commit to self-care and self-love, right? Those kind of things are, you're making decisions without making decisions, right? If you don't make them, then you made a decision. So yeah, I agree. Yeah. To be clear, all of our students will have access to all their materials until they pass the exam. So that's not something you have to worry about. What worries me when I read that kind of a comment is that student's already giving up. Now, they may have good reasons for thinking it's my first time at the exam, or I've got a language problem, or there's something else going on. And those are all perfectly legit. But I, at boot camp, we play a video of Wonder Woman running across no man's land. And it's pretty powerful video because it really exemplifies this idea that you just have to be willing to go all out, right? You have to you have to get out of your discomfort and just do the hard thing, no matter what. And sometimes I think it's easier to just say, I don't expect to pass. I'm not going to go all out because if I went all out and I failed, that would mean I'm a failure and I don't want to deal with that. So I'll just give myself the escape hatch that I probably won't pass. But unfortunately, when you once you've said that, once you've put that into your non-conscious, it begins to process and say, of course, you won't pass. And it helps you get to that point where you don't pass. And so often it takes a real jolt to make you realize that you have to be all in. The great line about how do you get your troops to fight on foreign soil is you burn the ships. 
you just make it impossible to leave. You say you must stay to complete the mission. And I think that's the attitude I'd like to see a student take. And I understand when they're asking about access to materials, but it's concerning to me to think that any student would go to the exam anticipating that they would fail. That's really not what we'd like to see you do. Any other thoughts or comments about that? Because I think it's fairly significant. Yeah, I'd like to add a perspective to this too. In the first couple of years that I was in law practice and even on the bench, I would go back and look at my notes that I took during my bar exam prep. It helped me be relational to the material. The, the more that you do the mind maps and the better your mind maps are, the more you have them as a future resource for when a client's going to come in and they want to talk to you about something. Uh, and it's a great refresher. You can look at your mind map and know what the relations are between the various elements that may have to be proven. And when you're in that client meeting, then you're going to be able to use what they're telling you is the facts. And you're going to find yourself putting FLA together. You're going to find yourself remembering that mind map and this branch here and this branch relates to this other branch. It's not a waste of time. Even if you go in and you are the star student in the bar exam and you pass it on the first go round with the highest score in the entire universe, you that doesn't mean that this material isn't there for you later and what you're learning in terms of process won't help you later. Go at it. This is a professional competency exam, and you're just improving your professional competency the more you do your own work here. Absolutely. I want to jump to a couple of other quick questions, and then we'll get to you, Tracy, talking about light rail. One of the questions that we got along the same lines about timing was, is it too late to add photo reading? And I'll just answer that. It is not too late at all. Photo reading takes an hour a day for eight days while you're studying for the bar. That's all it takes to pick it up. And frankly, you'll learn most of it in the first three or four hours. Totally not too late to add photo reading. We had people adding it over the weekend and they'll be just fine. So don't hesitate. If you think you might want to add photo reading, it's an incredibly powerful tool, as you see from the testimonials and the case studies, and you have plenty of time to learn it. You'll get immediate access to start using it once you've ordered. And then the last question I wanted to address today before we got to Tracy was Amanda in her performance test workshops has had some students who have been assigned to do an objective task to a legal audience. And if you are familiar with my teaching on this, I believe that if you've got an objective task to a legal audience, that's a description of a bar exam essay, right? Objective, who wins and why, and the audience is legal. And when we're writing an essay, we write an FLA. If we've got a performance test that is objective in tone and the audience is legal, it makes sense to me to use FLA as a basic, though not entirely strict, but a basic writing structure. And the students, some of them are saying, well, I don't want to use FLA on a performance test. Um, my view on this is you should use it. It's a wonderful template and structure. And oftentimes in a performance test, organization is what gets lost. And the FLA structure helps you stay organized and stay on task. Amanda, you're our resident expert now on performance tests. What's your take on that? Yeah, and I actually went back recently real quick and watched your video on it. And I couldn't agree more that lack of organization will just, it will just ruin you on an MPT because there's so much information it requires you to synthesize and think. FLA on the objective legal helps you, it helps you stay organized, it helps you stay on task. And the other part of your process for MPT writing that's helpful is the time to just think and organize yourself. Because I see students when I'm reviewing these MPTs, they've clearly just started writing and they have wasted time writing on a topic or a paragraph that the instructions did not tell them to write about. Because the instructions usually tell you, don't cover this issue, or don't write a separate statement of facts, or don't talk about this, another associate is talking about it. So because they didn't take time to think and organize and look at the charge again, they've written. So they thought they didn't have time to think and organize, but now they've written things that 
the examiners aren't even going to look at. So I would say lack of organization can really just ruin you on the MPT. So take that time to gather yourself, think, use your headings. And if you get an objective legal, which you probably will, at least one of them, say yes, yes. <laughs> and the right in it. You can take a quick moment to praise whoever you like pray to or think to and say, thank you for looking out for me and write an FLA. Yeah. And look, if you're an issue spotter <laughs> sitting in a big box bar review and you get to a performance test, you're in deep trouble here because there's not really a good way to issue spot a performance test and still get through it in the time that's allotted. So I think our students have an enormous advantage because they've learned how to write an FLA for their essays. And now you just take that same skill and you just drop it into the performance test. And now you've got a template, a format that you can use to write. And as Amanda says, it is very likely, certainly on the UBE and in Georgia, that you're going to get at least one of those questions that will be objective legal. If you're in California, they like objective legal as well. And so I think it's almost a no-brainer to use this. Um, I developed it specifically for this purpose. And I think if you're doing that, you're going to see the value, but you got to practice it. If you're writing all over the board, if you're doing stream of consciousness performance test writing, get in the performance test workshop with Amanda. She will disabuse you of that notion very quickly. And when you have an objective reader looking at your writing, I think sometimes it's just incredibly valuable to have somebody look at your writing and go, you know what? I don't know. You may have thought you were being clear. You may have thought you were explaining yourself, but doesn't come across that way to me. And I know that all three of our coaches have this experience all the time. The student submits work and they go, boy, wasn't that awesome? And you're like, yeah, no, <laughs> it was not awesome. So there you go. All right. I wanted to save a couple of minutes. I'm curious to hear uh, the Denver Nuggets, of course, are the NBA world champions. That's a big deal here in Denver. First time ever. And uh, I remember growing up watching them in futility for years. So that was a very exciting week and weekend. I don't know if that's got anything to do with light rail, but I'm going to toss it over to you, Tracy, and see where you go with it. It actually does, because my son-in-law brought my 10-year-old grandson to the game on Monday night, and they live in California. And when I found out that my grandson was going to be here, I don't get to see him very often. I said, oh, you got to give me time to see him. Well, they were staying downtown, and they had about an a window of about an hour that I could come see them. Rush hour in Denver to go from where I live to downtown can easily take an hour and a half if there's no traffic messes along the way. And there always are, right? What do you have when you're going through rush hour? You have too many cars. You have people doing silly things going in and out of lanes when they shouldn't be. You have accidents that occur as a result you have construction you have detours you have all these things and you can't really plan for them so the only option is to start way early or you can take the light rail and you can get on the light rail and figure out what time you need to be at a place and figure out what time you need to get on the light rail where you are near I don't like, I don't go down very often and I don't ride the light rail very often. So I was a little bit nervous yesterday when I got on the light rail, but I figured it out. I backed it out. I just looked at, at the schematic and figured out what time I needed to get on the light rail to get down to my grandson on time. And I got on the light rail and I found myself looking at the the schematic, even though I was going to the end of the line and trying to figure out every stop along the way, are they doing this right? Should they be going a different way? Should I be going, getting off of this train and getting onto another train? No, you looked at it before and it's a straight shot. You don't have to worry about it. It's the end of the line. And as I was thinking about this and sitting on the train and getting less anxious, I realized I was trusting the process that was already set out for me. All the stops were already planned by somebody else. The timing was already planned by someone else. I was chuckling when Brianna was talking about trying to incorporate other big box courses into this course. And do I need to do that? That's akin to getting off at every stop and then looking 
to see, oh, should I get back on this train or should I get on a different train? Or maybe they don't have it. Maybe they don't know what they're doing. CBR is the light rail, folks. Just get on where you are and figure out where you need to be at the end. What's your timing? And let the train run. Someone else has figured this out. You don't need to jump up front and grab the steering wheel and make sure it stays on the tracks. You don't need to be the one to switch it when you come to the fork in the road. It's going to be done for you. So ride the light rail. Trust the process. I had a marvelous breakfast with my grandson, and it was great to celebrate the nuggets with him. And then, believe it or not, I was able to get back on the light rail and get myself home. Go. Oh. So there you go. So just call me Engineer Jackson. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Choo choo. <laughs> choo choo. There you go. So we are on the uh, we are on the bar exam express, getting closer. Forty some days to go. We will be back next Wednesday to update you on all things bar exam related. Take your questions. And so if you're in the course and you've got questions, feel free to email them or post them in the community group and we will address them as time permits. Jackson? Yes, June. Peter posted directly to me and I wanted to share it because he said he didn't have enough time to repost it, but he heard a quote recently and this is what he's using to keep the goal in perspective. And I love it. The quote is meant to be starts with me. There you go. I like it. I like Thanks, it. Peter. All right. Thank you all panel for being here. Tracy, Brianna, Amanda, June. Glad to have you with us. Appreciate it as always. To all of you who are with us today, we appreciate your time. Hope that this has been valuable for you. Have, hope everybody has a good study week. Don't let the dreaded seventh week catch you. If you start to lose your cool, just take a breath, relax, jump on a group coaching call. Make sure that you are not trying to do this on your own. We're here to help you and we want to do that. And we will see all of you again next week. So take care, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.